Hello, A Pushers. JB here to talk about period one, or part of my unit one, pre-Columbian civilizations and European settlement. This is my unit one A. If you go to my website, jbapmh.wikispaces.com, you'll see that my unit one A is actually period one. Unit one is both period one and period two in my classroom. So just to clear that, clarify for you on that one. Also, I'm going to be talking about ways to cover the content effectively also provide some strategies to target historical thinking skills and themes but also in each of the each either side of the of this powerpoint you'll see in the notes i target key concepts just to give you an idea of you know if in case you needed to do this for lesson planning or just to explain to the students what what you're focusing on okay so here we go pre-columbian civilizations and european settlement well this is a very brief uh, slide on how the Native Americans showed up in the Americas, uh, the prevailing theory, the land bridge, uh, Eurasians crossing over into this and going all the way from North America to Central America and to South America. Now let me uh, take this opportunity to tell you that I do not have a specific slide on the Aztecs, the Mayans, or the Incas. I don't. I don't really get into them. I don't talk about the details. That's just me. I will reference them in passing. I will kind of, you know, I, I do this based on the assumption that they've been hearing about these three civilizations uh, from elementary school, middle school, and possibly world history. So I don't really spend that much time on that. I don't really cover them. I really want to concentrate in the North American region. So just to clarify for you on that one, if you want to do it, by all means, go for it. But then again, I am going through this in a more effective means. And I don't think that you don't have to concentrate too much on the Aztecs, Incas, or, or Mayans. Okay? Although when you talk about the Spanish, that's a different story. So you may want to have you know minor references to them. So you can talk about this very briefly. This is very important. Please have your students understand and know this map. Talk about the regions, okay? Just to clarify for you, there are key concepts specific to the eastern woodlands in the southeast uh, in the Mississippian culture. There is a key concept that's specific to the Great Plains and Great Basin, both of them together in that key concept. Then there's one specifically for the southwest, and then now, this is new, there's one for the northwest coast in California. They took that out. It used to be combined with the southwest. They, in this revision, they took the northwest coast and separated from the southwest. It's its own subconcept. So just so you know. And they don't have to know where every single tribe is. You know, if you want to scare them, you can tell them they, they need to know. But really, they need to know the regions. Have them know the, you know, the descriptions of the regions in regards to the environment. Okay? The geography of these regions. Okay? And, you know, talk about, you know, just based on their basic geography, why are these regions uh, distinguished like this? And get into that because that is important because we're, when we talk about these pre-Columbian civilizations, how they set up environment, ge geography, environment, geo, that's the theme, is very important. So please make sure that you point this out to them. You can see, you can mention some like the Algonquin in the Eastern Woodlands and the Iroquois. You can talk about the Southeast, eventually reference the Cherokee, see where the Cherokee are. This is great for synthesis, okay? Just kind of, you know, set it up for future. In the Great Plains, I like to use the Sioux, okay? I, in the Great Basin, you can talk about the, the Ute, okay? But I, I really don't concentrate too much on the Great Basin. I kind of just lump them in with the Great Plains. I know they're geographically distinct. However, they're essentially similar, okay? In the Southwest, there you go. You got the Pueblo. The Navajo is a good one. Okay. The Apache. That's good. That's good history. Okay. And then you go to the Northwest Coast. This is good to use. And, you know, I know there's the Plateau and the Nez Perce, but you can kind of throw them in there. And then you get the, the Cayuse there. You can talk about that um, but very briefly. So good map to use, good map to reference. Have your students know the regions. It'll, it'll help them out. So when I really talk about pre-Columbian civilization, uh, I, I kind of, you know, go over the terms of nomadic and sedentary. And that's very important because you can use those terms to describe the different region uh, of, of civilizations. Uh, gender roles, that's pretty self-explanatory. You can get into that. There's religion, the animism. That's good to distinguish, especially with the religion that's coming from Europe eventually. Okay. 
then there you go there's my uh, breakdown of the different regions there's the eastern woodlands hunting and agriculture and the three sisters fur very important corn beans and squash those are your three sisters very 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 important have them know that one you got the hobo you got the iroquois the algonquin you don't have to get into every single one of those but that's you know pick one and drive it and that's all you need to do okay but it's the it's the geography and the environment and i would really go with you know this is a hunting and agriculture uh you know this is get in the trade with the fur and that sort of thing so very important i talk about the mississippian their hunter agriculture you know you're getting in the southeast here those are the mound builders i like to talk about that and show a picture uh great plains very important you know hunting the buffalo the sioux i like to use them and those you know those where i'll say that those are nomadic why you know talk about the geography of the great plains okay very important southwest that's awesome to talk about geography you know you can reference the grand canyon you can talk about las vegas before it was las vegas and it's like it's the desert and then you can ask the kids like i don't understand how are they able to grow corn where's this corn come from? a maize and you can talk about how the maize comes from uh you know central you know south and central american cultures it comes up into the north america and says hey by the way check out this very nutritious crop here and so I was like, how are they able to grow corn in the in this very dry arid rocky environment how do they do that and that's where you can talk about irrigation and you bring up the irrigation and they brought the river to them you know and so you can use the anasazi the pueblo and you can uh, describe how the stone and adobe structures, I'll get to that in a second, I'll show you that. And then the Pacific Northwest, hunting and fishing, salmon. But why hunting, why fi but why fishing? Great rivers, the Pacific Ocean, plentiful, okay? That, that environment, that geography over there, very wooded area, okay? The cedar wood, but that's where we get those totem poles. You see how they adapt this, and I'll show you that in a second. And, and I use this picture here. This is great for, you know, analyzing, um, you know, this is a technically secondary source. Um, you know, and what we're doing, because actually not an actual painting, but an artist depiction of what could have been. Okay. So you here have this major civilization, uh, this major trade center right here, uh, what is going to be future uh, St. Louis. And I just talk about it and I go, man, think about it, guys. The Europeans said, eh, uncivilized, natives uncivilized, they have no idea how to uh, run themselves. What are you talking about? Look at this picture. What do you see here? And you talk about it and it's like, oh my God, I see monuments and I see homes and I see pyramids and I see massive structures. It looks like a, 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 a metropolis here, you know, and it's like, well, why? And I go, oh, look, there's the water. Oh, that's how they got to use the river. You see the rivers and the tributaries, one major river back there. And wow, they, you know, maybe, you know, that's how they were able to grow crops. And then I was like, yeah, but what else? What else about those rivers? Let's talk about those rivers. Oh, those rivers. Mm, that's where the water comes from. Awesome. But what else? And then this is where I try to get them to talk about how the rivers are the highways of pre-Columbian civilizations. That's trade. That's trade. And they're going to trade their crops and, and, and other resources with other other civilization, other tribal civilizations up and down the rivers here. And that's what you get into, and that's what you talk about. You can talk about this with these different civilizations, and 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 there you go. There you've you've been able to provide students a visual understanding of how the natives um, adapted to their environment, used their environment to their advantage. And I also like to use visuals in in describing these different civilizations. There's the mounds. Uh, the Serp you know, Great Serpent Mountain in Ohio, the mound builders, and, you know, again, talk about Europeans. How is that uncivilized? How, that's, that's amazing. That's fantastic. It's uh, great architecture. What are you talking about uncivilized? And, and, and you can say, and, and what do they use those mounds for? You know, why, what's the purpose here? You can get into that. You go to, uh, you go to Kincaid here in the bottom left. Again, just kind of reiterating the idea of, I mean, this looks like a city. This <laughs> This could be a suburb. Who knows, you know? And, but why? Why, why, why? And get into that. Then you go into the top right corner, and I like to use this picture to, to describe the Great Plains, and they can say, like, oh, of course they're nomadic. That's the teepees. Oh, how does the teepees help out? And they go, oh, well, those are... Those are easy to, you know, put up and down. And then if you gotta go, if you gotta get out of here, move, follow the buffalo where the buffalo roam, and there you go. The TV's easy peasy out of here, you know. Then I ask them this question: I go, "What's wrong with this picture?" 
And that's where plenty of students get this. But that's where that one student wants to say, oh, there's a horse there. What's wrong with that? Well, the horse wasn't there yet. The Europeans brought that. So you can talk about, you know, uh, is this an actual primary source or is this, you know, a, you know, a secondary source depicting, you know, the past type of thing. That's what you can, uh, you can use that opportunity for that. You go to the bottom right. There you go. Uh, Cliff Palace out here in the southwest. How they built into the cliff, into the mountain, and you know that's where the Spanish were like, "I miro un pueblo," you know. And there you go. You get the idea of they built into the rock. You know, it's amazing. And and you can talk about the stone and adobe structures, and boom, there's a great example. And then you have the totem poles in the Pacific Northwest. And that's, you know, the figure is like, wow, these are amazing. And, you know, these tell the stories and this, 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 has, uh, this helps to preserve the culture and the religion and the history of the tribe. And you figure is like, man, oh, why, you know, wh what gets the totem poles? Where does this come from? And you figure is like, again, cedar forest. This is a heavily forested area and they got plenty of wood. And there you go. So it's, 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 it's a great uh, illustration of how they can use the geography environment of their area uh, to define their, their civilization. Okay, now we go to Europe. Okay, so what's going on in Europe? Do not spend too much time on this. Please do not spend too much time on this. Okay, just, just get this basically is going to be used to explain why Europe went to America. Okay, that is why. All right, this is basically key concept 1.2 in, 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 in why um, we, they want to explore and conquer what's going on. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can talk about the Renaissance, technological innovations. Uh, I like to mention the astrolabe. I like to mention the caravel. Uh, we have the growth of nation states. You know, in the Middle Ages, Europe was a mess politically. You know, the Roman Empire fell so long ago, it's basically been fiefdoms and small little kingdoms here and there and that sort of thing. And then, as the economy started picking up, okay, more trade, you know, after the Crusades and and, and, and other reasons. Remember, don't spend too much time on this. But then, I say, like, hey, why can't we trade East? Why can't we do that? You used to do that. If you know your world history, why can't we do that? Oh, the Ottoman Empire. And Constantinople is in the hands of the Ottoman Empire. And so they're making it very difficult to trade east. So, you know, how about we go somewhere else? Let's go around Africa. Oh, that trip is uh, uh, it's horrible. Okay. West then. Well, I don't know. I don't know. It's scary. It's scary. <laughs> well, we need resources because Spain is now unified. Okay, France is its own kingdom, and then you got England and, and the Dutch, and they're all saying we need resources, and uh oh, you know, we're, we're having competition, and you know, what do we do? What do we do? And we can't go east. Well, we'll find another way. We have to. Okay, so these are their, you know, you start getting into the reasons. Please don't spend too much time on European history. I also like to mention briefly the Protestant Reformation and the religious wars, especially Calvinism. Especially the Church of England. I love to, uh, I briefly do get into that story because it's just a hilarious story. So why do we get the Church of England? Because Henry VIII wanted to divorce Catherine of Spain so he could uh, marry Anne Boleyn. And boom, all of a sudden the Pope says, no, I can't grant a divorce, even though he was granting divorces left and right. Uh, but because Spain and the Pope are super Catholic or super Catholic, you know, it's a political uh, maneuver. So... So what does Henry VIII do? He just sets up his own church with him at the head of the church. Fantastic. Love it. That's how we do things around here. That's just the European way. So then, boom, you get that. You get the Anglican church. That's going to be a reference to use later on. And then you have the Catholic Counter-Reformation. Oh, we got to we gotta get more Catholics here. So, very briefly, talk about the reasons why we want to go to America. That's the most important part. Okay, but don't spend, don't get lost in European history. I know it could be exciting for some of us. I would love to teach AP Euro and I would love <laughs> to get more into this. But this just is reference for why we go, why the Europeans go to America. And there you go. Three G's. God, glory, and gold. God in regards to spreading the Catholic faith. faith. Okay, that's the Spanish, that's the French. Okay. Uh, we can also talk about some of the various... Other religious reasons, uh, especially among the different European, I'm sorry, English colonies, okay, uh, you know, getting away from religious persecution, 
being able to freely worship or you know that's also part of the god aspect so there's one reason glory power uh we're in the age of mercantilism we need resources we need a favorable balance of trade we need and then this gets into gold and you know th this is this is the idea of getting the gold and silver getting these resources so more political power stronger nation state be able to, you know, go to war with the, with the other nation and just to have that prestige. And then, you know, you need the resource. You need to feed that mercantilism. You need the gold. You need the silver. You need the crops. You got to find a way to, to build that trade and to monopolize those crops and, 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 and monopolize the land and, and expand the empire. So God, glory, gold. And I like to really just focus on Spain, France, and England. Um, don't spend too much time. I just put these for reference, you know, Christopher Columbus for Spain and Jacques Cartier for France and the St. Lawrence River, the Dutch and Henry Hudson, you know, you could talk about New Amsterdam very briefly. And then of course, England, you know, charter colonies, proprietary colonies, royal colonies. I don't talk about that too much because I want to talk about that later in, in my, in my unit one, uh, B. Okay. So just kind of, you know, this is just the start in the beginning, very, very beginning. Okay. I mentioned this, you know, it, briefly, brief story. You know, it's good. To, it's good to talk about the Treaty of Tordesillas between Spain and France. Hey, it's just a good story. Just you know, I just very brief, very brief. Okay. Uh, very important. Very, very, very important that the students have a geographical reference of the big three here. Okay, you can even throw in the Dutch and New Amsterdam or what's going to be New York, but you can see you have Spanish Florida and New Spain. Very important. You have. New France and Louisiana, all that land. That's some, oof, okay. And then you got the 13 colonies. And of course, you got the West Indies, but there's your students need to know where who's where because that's that is very important, especially for later. Okay. So, you know, Great Lakes, St. Lawrence River, Mississippi. Um, sorry about that. And that's France, 13 colonies on the Atlantic seaboard. You got Spain and Florida and in uh, the Southwest. So, that's, that's, you know, make sure. This slide is great for discussion. And this is very important. And as you can see, I don't have any kind of uh, bullet points. It's just this image. And it, I use just this image to facilitate a discussion. And this is where you really get into key concept 1.2 um, and talk about the Colombian exchange. Okay, so uh, it's actually 1.22, okay, with the Columbia Exchange. And 1.22 has a very, um, I'm sorry, 1.1a, 1.11, okay, a, b, and c, is a very European centric. Um, that's it's it's really saying it's really going to the European side here. So one point two one, you want to talk about how corn and potatoes um, and tobacco go over to Europe and how and all those all those crops. But don't don't you know they don't need them to learn the list or anything like that. But corn and potatoes would be very excellent. Uh, crops to focus on to use okay uh, beans would be another one tobacco right so but corn and potatoes because those are more nutritious and of course you know you have the Irish okay the Irish uh, potato famine later on all right but when that helps the population to grow in Europe because there now we have alternatives to to the grain that we have in Europe so this is going to be able to feed this population and lead to more um, demographic impact on Europe and its economy and in its politics. So get into that. Um, and then, of course, you have the other side, right? European crops and livestock and, of course, the all-important disease, okay? Because um, the grains, yes, we're going to grow grains. That's going to be essential later on in American history. Uh, sugar cane, you can get into sugar cane, uh, sugar cane plantations, livestock, 
especially cattle and the horses. Cattle and horses, I would that's what I would stick with. Um, the cattle, of course, has its effect on the environment, especially later with grazing. And then, of course, the horses that are definitely going to have an impact on native civilization, especially in the Great Plains. So these are the these are the discussions, you know, facilitated discussion where you can try to get kids to make those connections on what's the impact of this this interchange here is um, this exchange of crops, people, and then of course the diseases, and you got smallpox and influenza, all those European Eurasian diseases that head over into the Americas and wipe out ninety percent of that population, unfortunately, and is gonna prompt uh, other demographic changes as in uh, those from sub-saharan africa west africa and how they're going to be uh, by force uh, sent to the americas as labor because of the impact of europeans on the native population and we'll get a little bit more into that okay talk about this use this just to facilitate and this is a very very important but talk about both sides you have to talk about both sides I used to kind of just briefly get into Europe, but now you have to you have to talk about how it goes from feudalism to capitalism. Get into that. Talk about that. Don't spend too much time there, though. Okay, you don't have to do well. Here's what's happening in Spain, and then here's what's happening in France and Europe as a whole. All right, but really, the major focus should be on what happened what, from Europe to America, and talk about that that part of the exchange there. Okay, this is an opportunity to analyze point of view. Um, also purpose, you know, this is a very oppor the great opportunity to practice HIP, okay, uh, document analysis, uh, the, the European point of view of natives, um, this, this, this for top one is kind of a series of depictions of the natives, these are European artists doing this, uh, that first one is kind of, you know, you notice how there's this European, uh, I guess you could say design of the native, all right, uh, in a, in a more European artistic, uh, you know, they're almost, they're almost like godlike in a sense. Or, you know, look at the giants, okay? Uh, I guess, you know, you get in the point of view, it's like, did they see, did Europeans see them that way? And you especially look at the third one, and you're like, oh my god, you know, look at this, with a huge bow, and just, you know, it kind of seems like overpowering the European. So, um, you know, talk about that. And, you know, how they this probably may explain some reasons for why Europeans had such an impact on the natives. And then you go on the bottom one, and you can see the series of, of just, I mean, it says the cruelties used by the Spaniards on the Indians. And there's all kinds of stuff going on here. And 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 maybe ask the students questions about, okay, did this really, do you think this really all happened? Do you think this, are, or is this, or is this somebody trying to really, really pull at the heartstrings of Europeans to try to convince them that we need to treat the natives like real people, you know, as equals? Something to think about. Something to you know get into and see. Maybe that's 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 the idea. So um, I'm gonna leave that you know for you to get into and try to see if you want to use this. I I, I get into it because I really want to start practicing. But here's the opportunity to do that. Then we talk about how th there's basically this key concept. One point two two is basically all Spain. It's almost all Spain. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's the Spanish empire. So this is where you can get into the whole, like, if you want to reference the Aztec, the Mayans and the Incas, um, what, you know, this is a new slide for me, by the way, I actually had them all, all three, the big three, Spain, France, and England together. Now I'm just, you know, I was like, okay, well now we gotta, you know, really focus on the Spanish here. So I talk about how it's the royal, you know, it's, it's absolute monarchy. It, it's, it's, run by the by the by the kingdom you know the royal colonies and they have these viceroys that are really uh running the show out there so you can get into that and understand that spain is super catholical okay they really want to spread that catholicism and this is of course gonna you know they're gonna have some run-ins with the with the native population and you know the missions and the jesuits and you know trying to convert to catholicism and as part of that God reason, and then you get the Pueblo Revolt. Now, technically, the Pueblo Revolt is 1680, so that's technically out of period one time period because that's 1491 to 1607. But see, this kind of kind of explains why I put period one and period two together. Um, so be careful. Technically, the Pueblo Revolt is 
um, in period two in regards to timing and, chrono and chronological aspect. But you do want to use it as a way to reference the struggles. Um, and there, the Pueblo Revolt is actually specifically listed in the uh, curriculum framework, so you do want to talk about this. Um, but what happened in the Pueblo Revolt is very similar to what would happen um, uh, throughout the Americas uh, when it comes to uh, interaction, especially with the Spanish. Spanish were not nice. They were not nice at all. 100% um, not nice? No. But they, <laughs> they were not great. And uh, you get into labor and, you know, what are we, you know what's up with the labor? And you get the uh, encomienda system. And this is where <clears throat> the Spanish nobles granted land in the Americas. And on that land, he's granted a labor force, which just happens to be a native. So that's basically slavery. And the natives are like, what? Now, this could be for uh, plantations. This could be for mining. And the natives are not accustomed to either one of them, at least not the European style, especially the mining. Okay. And remember, what are we mining for? Gold silver, any other kind of precious metals or any other, you know, maybe iron, but plantations, these could be sugar plantations, okay? So, um, that's not really going to, uh, that's eventually going to go by the wayside, especially due to the efforts of one particular individual we'll talk about in a second. Uh, then you have the asiento system, and this is where the Spanish really started bringing over West African slaves. And this is a focus on the key concepts here, key concept. 1.22 C and the idea of partnering with West African groups and you can talk about how uh, the Spanish government granted not just Spanish not just Spanish uh, slave traders but even English uh, even Dutch they granted these asientos and this brought over uh, slaves from West Africa African-American slaves I'm sorry African slaves from uh, West Africa and how are they able to do that and here you should talk about this you talk about how you know they traded uh, primarily weapons now I always explain to my students and I go you know why don't the West Africans use the weapons against the European I mean what's going on here is like because um, West African tribes you know the culture was in sub-Saharan sub -Saharan Africa is that when a when one African tribe went to war with another African tribe, uh, whoever the victor was, um, the prisoners of war would become their slaves. <clears throat> that's how it was. That's that's been that was the culture. The Europeans come over and decide to how can we make this more economical? Well, you know, and bam! All of a sudden, they say, "Ah, labor force." So, what do you do as a European? You start trading. Okay, you say, "Here's weapons." You are now a more powerful African tribe. Now you can go to war with that other tribe. You get prisoners of war, and now you sell them into slavery. Bam. Turns into a lucrative business. Unfortunately, it exacerbates this slavery problem. And, of course, this starts the migration of uh, West Africans um, to the Americas. And this is where you get, you know, you can talk about this with the asiento system. Then, of course, you have the Spanish caste system, and they want you to talk about this in key concept 1.22D. Okay, and there you go. I've given you a little, uh, uh, you know, social pyramid here. The peninsulares, the creoles, or criollos, and mestizos, and then you got the mulatos. And, um, and then, of course, you notice, it's a good discussion here. Uh, you know, this could be synthesis later on. It's like, is this, would you find this in later? Especially, say, the south? You know, does would that look like the South? You know, we just changed the names here. Uh, would that look about right? So, this is a great opportunity to talk about the Valladolid controversy, and this is where you can introduce uh, a famous person, Bartolomé de las Casas. And here, this one really would be great for key concept one point two three C. Okay, uh, fostered a debate among European religious and political leaders about how non-Europeans should be treated. Bam. You have uh, Juan Ginés de Sepulveda, and he looks at the natives as totally inferior, uncivilized, um, naturally slaves. That's his, and, you know, he writes about concerning the just cause of war against the Indians, like, uh, war, yeah, of course. 
they need to be because they need to be Christianized. They need to be conquered, and they need to serve the empire. And you can see that in this quote. You know that's his that's his position. But then you have Bartolomé de las Casas, and he is just appalled by the treatment of the natives, by the Spanish. And he's like, "Oh my God, this is not. I know we're supposed to spread the faith." But that's not how we should do it. We shouldn't do it by conquest. We shouldn't do it by war. We need to act like Christians. Because you're going to have animosity. You're going to keep having war because they're not going to appreciate the forced spread of the faith. And, and, and you can't treat them as slaves. They need to be treated as equals. And they're quite capable of civilization. Now, here's a great opportunity because it tells the students... I say, here's a great point of view exercise, just so you understand. Bartolomé de las Casas has been to the Americas. Juan de Sepulveda never went to the Americas. He never once stepped foot over there. So he's basing his opinion, his philosophy, on other people's accounts. What he's been reading, what, he, what testimony he receives. And... That's that's his philosophy, and the 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 king gets these two together, and over a series of, of debates, they say, "All right, figure. What am I supposed to do? Figure it out." And of course, Abubakar says, "This is what you gotta do. You gotta just conquer them." And Bartolomé Casas says, "No, we gotta spread the faith like uh, as good Christians, and you can use these quotes. You can get into this, and it's great opportunity to talk about perception." An interpretation and you know that an SAQ or even a multiple choice question could be based on something like this so I use this opportunity to really uh, you know deal with interpretation uh, by these by these uh, two you could say they're, they're historians but primary sources uh, but also look at that point of view the idea of, you know what's their purpose you know the intended audience and the context great opportunity for this okay the French Gotta talk about the French. It's again a royal colony, you know, uh, run by the run by the monarch. France is also pretty Catholic, although we have you know there's some Protestant Reformation uh, going on the Huguenots, but you can basically say this is uh, pretty Catholic. The Jesuits and you know there's Catholic conversion. Natives don't really take this very well, but out of the three, the French are the coolest. Let's put that in relative terms. But out of the three, Spanish, French, and English, the French are the good ones. The French are the good ones because they get it because they get it. They realize, you know what? We should work with the natives. They got it down here. All right. Look at this. The fur trade. They start getting into that. They start talking, they, you know, the, forget my French, Kuru de Boy and Run of the Woods. And this is basically the, the origin of the, the, the frontiersmen, the, 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 the mountain men. Okay. And these French, start learning how, you know, the fur trade and, and, and the hunting and, you know, navigating through the rivers and through the woods. And and the French get it. The French, you know, in, in regards to Native relations, they, they, they work with the, with the Natives in regards to economics. They form political alliances, especially against the British, um, uh, especially against the Iroquois. The, you know, they, 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 they intermarry. Um, by the way, the Spanish uh, intermarry as well, as you can see with the scat you saw in the caste system, um, and, and and that's that's what you talk about with the French. And you know they get it. They 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 they, they re this is why they're the good ones. Okay. Then of course you have the English. Now the English, uh, you know, not a lot of royal colonies, not really run by the monarch. We know about this eventually because of benign neglect, solitary neglect for a while, and. You know, you have the charters, and that's when I mentioned earlier about the proprietary colonies and the charter colonies and the royal colonies, but also the joint stock companies. And you have to talk about that. You have to get into that because the key concept brought that up. Um, and here is where actually key concept 2.1 really gets into this. Um, it talks about the Spanish, the French, and Dutch. Um, and the English, the, all these descriptions I'm doing, these relations with, especially with the natives and, and how, what the, you know, how they set up their early colonies, it's in 2.1 and you figure like, wow, this, this is more, you know, this is more in period one is like, so be, this is why I like, you know, I like to consolidate period one and two into one unit. 
because there's overlap there there's immense overlap here so um you know you you, you got to talk about the joint stock companies how that works uh you don't have to get too much into that because i like to get into the, in the next unit part my 1b uh but the, you know those are the reasons um you know what some colonies you know for religious freedom population growth okay um you also have uh you know who's coming over and So you talk about the men, women that came to the English colonies as opposed to the French and the Spanish, where it really was just men. Uh, with the Spanish, you're talking about the conquistadors, you're talking about military men. Uh, with the English, it was a more diverse group, uh, really beginning mostly with men, uh, especially in the southern uh, colonies, but the uh, New England colonies had more family-oriented uh, demographics coming over to uh, the uh, across the Atlantic into the English colonies. So something to talk about when you compare and contrast these uh, the, the the big three here in regards to who's coming over here from the England, France, and Spain. Uh, the English are not cool with the natives, but you, you know. Your granddad was like, well, <laughs> wasn't cool with the natives. <laughs> when you talk about the Spanish and the French and the English, um, the English at first got help from the natives. Um, you know, there's mixed results when you compare New England, the middle, and the southern colonies. Um, but for the most part, in general, natives, you know, helped the English, you know, learn about the food, learn about, you know, the types of crops, how to grow them. Uh, the different trades and learning about the alliances but that was really in the beginning it's afterwards when the English said okay thanks for the tips and now we're gonna start taking your land and that's when the animosity really started brewing and you can see that you know there, there's a series of wars and here's some major wars the Anglopolitan Wars, the, those are in Virginia, especially with, you know, around Jamestown. You have the Pequot Wars, and then you have King Philip's War. Granted, these wars um, are really still, in, they're technically in period two, uh, after 1607, but you have to, you know, you get into the explanation of, you know, the relationship between the English and the natives, the Europeans, and uh, this gets into period uh, key concept 2.1 with the English, but it's a great way to compare and contrast. But remember that no DBQ or LEQ will exclusively be on period one. So it's you know you may get a you may get a DBQ or LEQ prompt that would overlap, uh, you know beyond 1607. So it's something something to consider. So you have these wars. And the English were not big on intermarriage. And they were not big about really, you know, integrating with the natives. They excluded them. They pushed them west. And, you know, relationships were not, uh, were not as, as, as established as you see in France or, or even in Spain. I know Spain is, uh, mistreats them, but they intermarried. And they have a whole caste system with uh, intermarriage. So, but the English, not so much, not so much. And you, your kids can tell you, well, there's, there's John Rolfe and Pocahontas, you know, you know, yeah, there's exceptions. We're not talking about a rule here, but in general, uh, the English were very excluded, segregated, whatever synonym you want to, you want to use, not very inclined to work well with the natives. So... As you can see in this uh, key concepts and notes, you'll see which key concepts are targeted for each slide, just to give you an idea. So, uh, smallpox. Uh, this is a primary source, 1575-1580, uh, depiction of the natives suffering from these European Eurasian-born diseases, such as smallpox, uh, influenza, and you can see the suffering, remember 90%, you talk about such an impact, such an impact on this. Now, I, I need to warn everyone, the next slide is, can be intense, okay, so get ready, um, 
So and this is a warning, fair warning on here. So be careful on this next slide. This is all right. Let, let, let me just explain. This is a uh, more more recent, uh, relatively recent picture of picture photograph of someone suffering from smallpox. It is intense, just as let you know. So there we go. Just to you know, show the students, this is what it is. It is a very very painful painful disease this person this this poor individual is writhing in pain all those blisters the reason that their arms are like that is because they it, 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 it's kind of like a sunburn and you just have your arms like that because if you move them or anything like that it's just excruciating these blisters so um the idea is to you know i i, I do this to the students you know, not not because I want to just gross them out or, 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 you know, really, you know, it's just like this is what happened to a vast majority of natives. And, and, it, and it's, 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 it's almost sickening. And just the idea of that, you know, what, what you know, the suffering and, and how the natives, I'm sorry, the Europeans took advantage of this, this uh, wipeout of the Native Americans. So... This is the period one SAQ that was put that was uh, uploaded by College Board on the scoring module, and I think this is a fantastic SAQ. I really like this SAQ. It's two historical interpretations, so that's a great historical thinking skill to target, and I think it's a great uh, exercise. Um, I think I think you should use this to introduce the SAQ. I think you should use this to introduce interpretation, especially of two historians. Um, it's a great, great SAQ. Uh, on, on the A Pushers Facebook, I did upload this to the files. So, you know, if you want to get this, you know, uh, join the A Pushers group, or if you're already there, uh, look through it through the files. Just all you got to do is A Push R period one SAQ set, and you should find it in the files very easily, uh, putting, you know, and putting it that way. And it's great. It's, it's, you know, I did this in a review when, you know, because the College Board did put this out there <laughs> much, much later in the year. But my students thought this was a great way to review the SAQ in regards to, um, you know, targeting interpretation and, of course, just the content. And it worked out very well. So use this. I put this on here on this side. It is on the, uh, it is on the, uh, my website. So... That's period one. If you have any further questions, let me know. You can email me at jburkj at dateschools.net, or you can contact me on the Facebook group, A Pushers, or on uh, on the YouTube channel where this will be. Okay. Hope this was. Uh, hope you got something out of this, and good luck this year with period one.